All right, y'all, I'm live. Prophet David Taylor here for Thursday night. No more genies. So I'm going to give people a few minutes to come on. Because I notice when I come on late, y'all think I'm not coming. So I have to come on early. Uh, so I'll explain once again why I'm in my car. Because I know you want to know. Why are you doing a video from your car? Why is it a car video? The answer to that question is because the enemy has been attacking my internet for weeks now. I tried to upload a video the other day and it crashed 55 seconds from upload. And then I tried to upload it again. Then the screen froze. And then I was trying to do some stuff on my phone and it kept freezing and stuttering and but that's all right, because I'm here on my post, because I have to stay faithful to my call. And I say that to anybody out there, uh, anybody that's watching this replay or anybody that went back and watched this video from the top, you have to stay faithful to your call. I know you want to start out on the Bishop T.D. Jakes level. Everybody wants to start out with a big public pa uh, platform. Everybody knows who you are. And you get launched on that level. I know that's how you want to start, but what would happen if you didn't? What would happen if you couldn't? What would happen if you had to, because Bishop Jakes didn't start where he is now. Bishop Jakes started preaching to the weeds, preaching to the grass, preaching to empty cornfields. He'll tell you that himself. See, so the question is, will you serve God faithfully in season and out of season? Will you serve God regardless of your circumstances? Because anybody can serve the Lord when it's easy. And anybody can, you can do a whole lot, you know, when you get a big platform launch. But what would you do if you didn't? And there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, if you want to get your grow your ministry or whatever, there's nothing wrong with that. I definitely want to grow mine. But would you serve God without it? That's the thing. Would you serve God without it? And so I'm saying that to encourage anybody that is, Starting out in ministry, no matter what your chronological age, uh, if you're starting out in ministry, you know, the question again is, you know, would you serve God without it? Now, that's not our prophetic word for tonight. That's just some of the preamble uh, that I'm saying until I'm giving people a chance to come on. But that is always the question. All right, hold on. Let me want to let my group know. I'll let my group know that I'm live because sometimes people have told me they didn't get the notifications or they didn't know that I was live. Uh, so, but have we got a prophetic word for you tonight? Oh my goodness. All praise and glory to God and praise Father and Son and the precious Holy Spirit for being here with us, leading us and guiding us into all truth. But, uh, just yes, we got a word tonight so you need to like this video you need to share this video and i say that because number one whenever a prophetic word comes forth as many people as possible need to see it so they can be edified by it and uh because we don't want to take the gift of god lightly i have also discovered by living that there are many 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 uh blessings that are missed and many 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 prayers that are answered but they're missed by people because they're walking around inside the skin of someone that you don't like. Okay, I see people are coming on now. Praise God. Thank you guys for coming on watching me live. Um, again, like this video, share this video in many places as you can. And uh, again, the reason I'm in my car is because the enemy has been attacking my internet for weeks now. I tried to upload a video, upload a video the other day and it, it crashed 55 seconds from loading. And uh, I tried it again, and then the screen froze. Tried to do stuff on my phone, and it kept freezing. But if I have to come out in my car, a place where I can get some good internet, I will. Because I was talking about you have to serve God faithfully in season and out of season. Okay? So I want that to be an encouragement to people that are in ministry. Because it's easy to serve God when everything's going well. Okay? But will you serve him when you're fighting a battle. Okay, so that is not today's uh, prophetic word. Today's prophetic word 
It's just seven o'clock, so we're gonna start on time and we're gonna jump right on in. Lord, I come to you thanking you, come before your throne, thanking you, thank you that Jesus is on the right side. Thank you that we stand in your grace. Thank you, God, they were forgiven because of the blood of Christ. Thank you, God, that you are our advocate and our Lord. You are on the right hand of God. The side that says that we are uncondemned and justified because you paid and you don't have to pay twice for the same sin. So thank you, Jesus, for paying. Thank you that there's no condemnation in Christ. Thank you, that, thank you that we stand in your grace. Thank you that God is a good God all the time. And all the time, God is good. Thank you, Lord, that once you saved, you're always saved. You can't lose your salvation. Oh, God, that once we save, we are forever sealed and we have eternal life. And we are part of the family. We are part of the kingdom. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that the life is in your son. It's based on Jesus and not what we do. Thank you so much, God. We don't have to earn it. But rather, it's unmerited favor that you give us because you are good based on Jesus. So I give you all the glory. So I die to myself right now, God. I take up my cross. I ask you to speak through my mouth and have in my body, my, my hand gestures, everything I say, oh, God, so that you might get the glory so that what you want said comes through so that you might be glorified in all things so that the saints might be edified and so the demons might be terrified and the believers might be challenged to turn from their way and to turn to you. Thank you for it. Believe you for it. We're expecting you to do great things and a declare and decree signs, wonders, and miracles shall follow all that receive this word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Amen and amen. Today's prophetic word, tonight's prophetic word now is called We Don't Need No More Churches. Very briefly, those of you that are watching me for the first time on Thursday night, the second Thursday of every night, I do a program that I created called No More Genies. And it's called No More Genies because we are moving away from the genie concept of God because faith is not magic. We are moving away from tradition. We're moving away from stuff that you heard. We're moving away from things that are not biblically accurate. And we are looking at what the word actually says. What does the word actually say so we can get a biblical concept of God and not this magic concept of God because the genie concept of God has messed people up. It has messed people up so badly, in fact, that people have lost their children. Their children have died. People have lost their lives. They've lost their fortunes. They've lost their minds because of the genie concept, because of thinking that God is a genie, thinking that faith is magic, thinking that all you have to do is rub the magic lamp or say the magic words, and it's going to be this magic, and none of that is true. So I started this program on second Thursday night to move us away from anything that's not scriptural but move us into what the word actually says, okay? Tonight's No More Genies, live prophetic No More Genies, Number Jesus number 30, this is my 30th entry in this program, is entitled, We Don't Need No More Churches. Now, right off the bat, I know you like Prophet Taylor, what are you saying something like that for? I'm going to explain it all. Don't worry. I'm revisiting some things. Remember I told you I wanted to revisit some stuff? I'm re revisiting some things that the Spirit of God gave me before, but I thought this was particularly appropriate for tonight as we close out this year which is also was an election year, which is one of the most contested elections we've seen since 2000 and 20 years since Bush and Gore. And we're turning our corner into 2021. Okay. We don't need no more churches. What a thing to say. How could a prophet of God say something like that? I'm about to explain it. Okay. So remember to like and share this video and share it with as many people as you know. Here's our first scripture reference. Our first scripture reference is going to be found in, uh, do I want second crop? No, I think I want Judges. Yes. I want Judges chapter 3, verse 11. Now, I don't have time to give you the full history, but the period of Judges is uh, after Joshua died. So Moses got him out of Egypt. Joshua took him into the promised land, and Joshua and Caleb helped him conquer as much land as they could. After Joshua died, Israel entered into the period of the Judges, meaning they had judges ruling over them and judging judges helping them fight their enemies. That's very, very truncated. That's a very brief version. Uh, version. We're going to look at Judges chapter 3, verse 11, Old Testament. So the land had peace for 40 years until Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. That was new NIV. 
uh, New International Version, New Living Translation. So there was peace in the land for 40 years and Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. Um, and they all pretty much say that. King James Bible, again, is my favorite. And the land had rest 40 years and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Why is that important? I'm about to show you, but I'm going to read you one more scripture that is also in Judges. And then I'll put it together. Judges 3 and 30. So that last one we read was Judges 3 and 11. Now we're going to read Judges 3 and 30. Okay? New International Version. That day Moab was made subject to Israel and the land had peace for 80 years. New Living Translation. So Moab was conquered by Israel that day and there was peace in the land for 80 years. English Standard Version. So Moab was subdue, subdued that day under the hand of Israel and the land had rest for 80 years. Why is that important and how is that relevant to our topic? I'm about to tell you. Let me put those. I'm putting the scripture references in the chat. So if you want to look those scriptures up for yourself, you can. Why is that important? I'll tell you why. For some reason that I haven't figured out, a lot of us have completely missed what God is saying do, and doing during this pandemic, during the coronavirus. God has taken his mighty hand and wiped out all of our religious systems and practices to the point where we can't go to church anymore like we used to. Now, I know some people, most people are doing stuff online. Some people have what they call drive-by worship, which I think is a fascinating concept. Some people are still trying to hold in-person live meetings. And in some states, that's legal. In some states, it's illegal. And then in some counties and cities, depending on where you live in America. Because uh, in Cook County, Cook County got put on another 30-day lockdown about 15 days ago. So why is that relevant to us? Here's why. If what we were doing as Christians was so effective, then where was the rest and where is the rest in America? I just read you two scriptures that under the Mosaic law, under the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, they served God. Now, under the Old Covenant, remember, Jesus hadn't come. So they sacrificed bulls, goats, pigeons, and turtle doves. That was their shed blood. And they had to do it every year, signifying that the shedding of the blood of animals could never permanently take away sin. So under the old covenant, under the blood of bulls and goats, because the Lord hadn't even come yet, they were able to serve God enough. And they were able to serve God well enough to where the land had rest in that one passage I read, the land had rest 40 years. That's two generations because a generation is 20 years. And then I read the other one where it said the land had rest 80 years. Okay. That's four generations. Excuse me. There okay? is a message for Four you. generations. Oh, my phone going off. Of course, it's going off now while I'm trying to minister. So let me put you on silence. Uh, no, it's not a uh, sister need to ask my other Facebook group, and I'm gonna say no, it's Facebook chat. But anyway, so the land had rest for 40 years, and the land had rest for 80 years. If what we were doing as a church, as the body of Christ in 21st century America, was so powerful, was so right, was making so much of a difference. Where has our rest been? Where is our rest now? Why is our country divided almost straight down the middle politically? Where Where is our rest? If they could get rest under the Mosaic law, under the blood of bulls and goats, where is the rest in America if what we was doing was so right? That's why we don't need no more churches. Now, don't understand what I'm saying. If God has called you to start a church, if God has called you to preach, by all means do that. But I'm going to show you tonight scripturally about what we need to do, because what I've heard over and over again is I've heard people asking God to take away Corona. Just, Lord, please get rid of the Rona. What I do not hear a lot of people saying is how God has already addressed how to make that happen. OK, so we're going to look at that, too. 
And so if what we were doing, see, see, a lot of people are busy trying to build up stuff that God tore down. Do you understand that? A lot of people are busy during, during this time trying to build up stuff that God has torn down because all of our religious systems, all of, uh, all of the, oh, I got to tell somebody where to find me live. All of the religious stuff that we used to do is all gone now. Hold on. Oh my. Facebook page. I'll put the, okay, I'm going to put the link in the group chat. So, because somebody's asking. Uh, where to watch me live. Okay. All right. So if what we were doing was so on point, then where is our rest? This is what I'm trying to understand. This is what I'm trying to understand how, how people don't understand that, how people don't see that, how people are continually trying to build up some stuff when God just took his mighty hand. God just took his mighty hand and tore it down. Okay. Oh, Lord, where is this link? Okay. God took his mighty hand and tore it down. So we are not uh, under the blood of bulls and goats. We're under the blood of Christ, but even under the blood of Christ, there it is. Where is our rest? Okay. Where is our rest as Americans? Where is it? Where is this link? Echoing myself. Where is our rest as Americans? If what we were doing, I want you to ask yourself that question. If what we were doing was so powerful, if what we were doing was so right, if what we were doing was so on point, then why is it all torn down? Why can we barely go to church now? Where is the rest? If they could have rest for 40 years and 80 years. <clears throat> Where is ours? If what we was doing was so right. Okay. So that's what I mean when I say more churches is not the solution. America has more churches and more opportunities to hear God than some countries have media in totality. We have more religious media, religious media alone, than some countries have media in general. So if we're broadcasting all this stuff and we got all these opportunities, we got all this church stuff going, why is our land so torn up? Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm saying. So maybe, maybe we're supposed to get the clue that all this stuff we were doing, God wasn't pleased with it. How can you make a statement like that, Prophet Taylor? I'm going to show you from the scripture. This is why I call this program No More Genies. You can't just make up stuff and call it God. That's what religious people do. You have to look up what the scripture actually says. Okay, so on this whole praying to get rid of the Rona, we're going to look at Second Chronicles seven fourteen. That's a very familiar scripture to those of you that are in the Word, and we quote it all the time. But we're actually going to look at it. We're going to look at it in the context of the coronavirus. We're going to look at it in the context of today's churches. We're gonna look at it in the context of what we've been doing because the whole earth has been stricken with a curse. Why is that if what we was doing was so on point? Okay, so let's look at 2 Chronicles 7.14. 2 Chronicles 7.14, you're very familiar with it, but we're gonna look at it word by word, line by line. I'll start with the King James, that's my favorite. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and, uh-oh, light went out. There we go, light back on. Humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. One more time. <clears throat> if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. God just gave us an if-then 
situation, an if-then problem, like a math problem, or like a, a command to uh, a computer in computer protocol language. God gave us an if-then. We're going to look at this line by line and word by word. First word is if. <laughs> that means it's conditional. If you don't know anything about prophecy, you need to understand that not all prophecy is absolute. If you want to deal with absolute prophecy, that's when the Holy Ghost says, this is going to happen. There's no negotiation. There's no talk. There's no nothing. The Holy Ghost say, thus said the Lord, this is going to happen. See, that's absolute prophecy, meaning it's going to come to pass and there's nothing that anybody can do to stop it. Sometimes, however, the Spirit of God will release conditional prophecy. And what that means is that God is saying, if you do this, then I'll do that. That means it's completely conditional. That means we can always call on God to hold up his end of the deal because God is equal to his word. Meaning if God says something, it's as good as done. It happens as soon as the Lord says it and it's going to come to pass. Heaven and earth will pass away before the word, before the word of the Lord fails. Okay. But if God says God gives you an if then conditional prophecy, what that means is that you have to hold up your end of the deal and you have to do it exactly like the Lord said, do it. OK, once again, you hear me say it all the time, but that's why I say it all the time. God is a person, not a set of rules. I'm so tired of religious people. That's why I started No More Genies. I'm so tired of religious people conveying this idea that God is a set of rules. Like if you check off these boxes, tick, 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 tick. I'm a good person. I'm saying I did this, blah, 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 blah. And that's not the Lord is a person. That's why you have a soul because he has a soul. God has a personality. Did you know that? God has ways. He has ways of doing things. Okay. And you have to get to know him to know that. Because everybody talking about God don't know him. And everybody singing about heaven ain't going. Okay. God's a person. He's not a set of rules. And the Lord has certain ways that he does things. And you have to get to know that as you get to know him. Just like your best friend. If you have a best friend, you're closer to them now than you were when you first met them. Do you know why? Because you've gotten to know them because you spent time with them. OK, uh, I'll give you a personal example. Uh, I had one of the best birthdays I ever had this year because my friends and my family hooked me up. But you know who always hits birthday gifts straight down the middle for me? And I'm not trying to diminish anybody else. Don't get me wrong. I enjoyed everything I got this year. But you know who always it has 100 percent straight down the middle record for me? My son. You know why? Because my son knows me. One year, I think for my students, I think I got an end of the year present and they gave me gourmet coffee. And I really appreciated it because I appreciate anything anybody does for me because don't nobody owe you nothing. But I am actually not a coffee drinker. So I appreciated the gesture, but I actually couldn't really use that because I don't drink coffee. But the stuff that my son gives me is 100 percent straight down the middle. Do you know why? Because he knows me. He knows who I am as a person. He knows how to buy me a gift that's exactly what I want every time because he knows me. OK, I stop by to tell you that it's no different with God. And this is where people get confused. God is a person. He's not a set of rules. So when the Lord gives you absolute prophecy, that's the Lord saying this going to happen. <laughs> There's nothing anybody can do once the mouth of the Lord has spoken. it. OK, because God does not break his word. But when God gives you conditional prophecy, that means you have to hold up your end of the deal or else it's not going to happen. So the first word in 2 Chronicles 7, 14 is if. God said, if, if who? If my people. What that means is that God is not expecting unbelievers or sinners to do it. There's only one line that God draws in humanity, and that line is believers and unbelievers. That's the only difference God makes between people if you didn't know that. We draw all kinds of lines. We draw color lines, age lines, gender lines, money lines, fame lines. That's not God. That's man. God only draws one line and it's believers and unbelievers. So God said, if my people, that means God is expecting believers to do this. He's not expecting sinners to do it. How could sinners do it? They don't have a Holy Ghost. How could they talk to Father and Son? Because you can't talk to Father and Son without the Holy Ghost. You don't know Father and Son without the Holy Ghost. Understanding and knowing God is not a matter of intellectualization. You don't think up on God. It's a matter of revelation. God takes a cover off your eyes, and that's what the Holy Ghost does. Okay? 
if my people who are called by my name under the Old Testament, that was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Uh, under the New Testament, that's us as Christians. We use the second part of, now Christ is not the Lord's last name. Christ means uh, the anointed one, uh, the Messiah, the chosen one. Uh, Jesus is the savior. He shall save their people from their sins. And he's anointed by God sent from heaven to do so. Uh, <clears throat> we use Christians in our name. Christians, we use his name. So if my people who are called by, name, by my name. So under the Old Testament, that's talking to the Hebrews, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Under the New Testament, that's talking to all that believe under the name of Jesus, the Christians. OK, who are called by my name uh, shall humble themselves. Now, <laughs> let me tell you something. You need to learn how to humble yourself because you don't want the Lord to have to humble you. I've heard people pray that prayer. That's a very dangerous prayer. And I would not recommend you praying that prayer because you don't want God to have to humble you. That ain't what God said. God said, humble yourself. What does it mean to humble yourself? I'll tell you exactly what it means. It means. Stop trying to tell the maker what to do. You are made out of clay and breath. You don't rush into God's presence and try to tell him what's best for you. You don't rush before God and try to tell him how something's supposed to go. You don't rush before God talking about your plans. You come before God and you surrender. You lay down. You say what Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. I'm not trying to tell you what to do, oh God, because you invented me. I only live because you made me and you formed me in my mother's womb. So what do you want me to do? Why did you create me, God? What is your purpose for my life? That's how you humble yourself. Not, why do you think so many people end up married to the wrong person? Because they went out and picked somebody and they ran in God's presence and said, okay, God, okay. Tried to make God rubber stamp it. Tried to make God stamp your choice. You never asked him <laughs> who you should marry. You never asked him what season of your life should you get married, if you get married at all. You rush into his presence and you said, I'm going to do this. And then you asked him to bless it. See, that's arrogant. You're trying to tell the maker how it's supposed to go. What if the maker has a destiny for you that like Jesus and Joseph starts at 30? So everybody else, you know, got married at 21 and you started whining and pouting because you thought you were supposed to get married at 21. But the will of the Lord was for you to get married at 30. But you never bothered asking him. That means your life is off by several years. What do I mean by that? I mean, there's some people that got married before they finished school and they never finished school. If they had waited a year or two, you could have had all of it. You could have had the degree and a spouse and all of your kids would just be two years younger. If you had asked the Lord. <laughs> but many times what we do is we jump up and do stuff because we're trying to tell God how we're supposed to go. And I remember that when I was really, really struggling with my prophetic ministry, I went to the Lord and I, I, I did like Moses. I had all these excuses and all my feelings. I was in my feelings and, you know, God, I think this and God, I think that. And you know what the Lord told me? The Lord told me, David, you're a prophet because I made you one. You're a prophet because I say you are. And you don't tell me how you serve me. Okay. You are a prophet because I said you are and I gave the prophetic anointing. I put my word in your mouth. That's not your choice. Your choice is whether or not you're going to live up to it or not. And there's a lot of other stuff he said to me in that conversation. But that's when, again, in that firm but gentle way, he was telling me, he's the potter, I'm the clay. He's the creator, I'm the created being. And I don't tell him, you know, well, Lord, I don't feel worthy, or Lord, I don't want to, or Lord, I don't see this, I don't see that. I don't tell, he said, this is why I made you. You don't tell me what you're for. You don't tell me how to glorify me. You don't tell me how your life is supposed to go. I tell you because I invented you. I'm the potter. Now, he, he didn't have an attitude. He was loving and, and gentle, but firm. And that, see, you have to know him to know what I'm talking about. He was gentle and loving and kind with that sweet, quiet way that he has, but very firm. Let me know that I'm clay. I'm clay and breath. And I don't tell the maker what I'm for. He tell me. And he says, the only the, the choice you have to make is whether or not you're going to live up to it, not what you're for. Because I formed you in the womb, just like Jeremiah. I made you to be a prophet. That's why you're a prophet, because I said so, said the Lord. That's what I mean. That's how you humble yourself. You stop arguing with God. A lot of people don't have good marriages 
because you keep trying to make your marriage work the way you think it should work. You never ask the Lord, what is your purpose in this? You just pick somebody and got married. You never bothered to ask the Lord. Some of y'all went to the wrong school. You went to the wrong college. You majored in the wrong thing, living in the wrong campus. Some of y'all are living in the wrong town because you never asked the Lord. That's what it means to humble yourself. It means to lay down your plans, your ideas, your perspectives, and ask the creator, what do you want? What is your will? What did you create me for? And if you go your whole life and you never ask God that question, you're going to end up like one of them people in Matthew 7, where you come before the Lord and you drag all these good works before the Lord. And you say, look at all this stuff I did in your name. And the Lord going to say, get out of my face. Depart from me. I never knew you. That's what's going to happen to you if you never humble yourself and you are always trying to run something, trying to tell God, popping your fingers at God like he's your personal genie. Again, that's why I call this no more genies. Thinking that you could just come up with a plan and God is just going to rubber stamp your plan and just endorse it and bless it because it's what you want. And you never bother to ask him. That's what God tried to explain to Abraham. Sarah said, I'm old. I've gone through menopause. I can't get pregnant anymore. So Abraham, you go ahead and sleep with Hagar and we'll have kids that way. And Abraham did it. Abraham went before God and said, oh, that Ishmael might stand before you. And God said, I'll, I'll bless him because he's your child. But in Isaac shall I see be called. In other words, God said, I didn't change my mind. Just because you and Sarah didn't believe me don't mean nothing. I told you, you and Sarah are going to have a baby. And I don't care how old you are. If I said, says God, you're going to have a baby, then you're going to have a baby out of your loins. You and her, not you and a surrogate, not you and a handmaiden, not you and a side chick. See, and Abraham started the Arab-Israeli war because the Ishmaelites became the Palestinians. And uh, that's what that whole conflict is about. It goes back as far as that. Because that's what happens when you do things out of the will of God. You didn't humble yourself and you didn't even bother to ask the Lord. You just did what you thought. It causes you problems, sometimes for decades. So God said, my people have to humble themselves. Then there's an and. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Why is that significant? Because when we talk to each other, that's dialogue. When you talk to God, that's prayer. Prayer is sacred. It's a thing set apart. It's not just like when we talk. When we talk again, that's just dialogue or conversation. When you talk to God, that's prayer. So in other words, you have to humble yourself and pray. You got to talk to the Lord. What I just explained to you, you have to talk to him. <clears throat> a lot of people, a lot of Christians go through their lives and don't talk to him. And the Lord already told you, if you do that, you're going to end up being one of those people that drags all their good works before God. And the Lord said, depart from me. We never had a relationship. I never knew you. In other words, you wasted your whole life. Yo, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 plus years of life on earth and you wasted it because you never asked the Lord what he wanted. You just assumed. So the Lord said, you got to pray. God said, you got to talk to me. But then there's another and. I told you, we going word by word, line by line. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and, and seek my face. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean, seek my face? It means that God wants a relationship because he's a person. He wants a face-to-face -face relationship. He does not want you to seek his hand. That's treating him like he's a genie. God, I want you to do this for me. So just wave your all-powerful hand and fix this for me and make this happen. Talking to God like he's a genie. That is not what he said. He did not say, seek my hand. He did not say, seek my power. He said, seek my face. But a lot of Christians treat God like rebellious teenagers. Think about this. Think about if you're in the house and you have a child that's 16 years old. They come in the house, they slam the door, they don't speak to you, they don't say hi, they don't ask how you're doing, they just say, give me the car keys. And then they snatch the car keys out your hand, then just throw them out the house. Now, <laughs> how does that make you feel if you're the parent? You feel deeply disrespected. Your children didn't even say hello. Hey, mom, hey, dad, how are you doing? How's your day going? Hey, mom, hey, dad, is there anything I can do for you? See, because you don't have a relationship. They just want stuff from you. That's how a lot of God's children treat him. They run into his presence and say, give me. Give me this. Give me. 
Give me that. Give me this. Give me that. And that's why I told you before with the humbling, you ask him, what do you want? Not here's my list of demands. <laughs> what do you want? So God said, you got to seek my face. You know why? I done said it 20 times because God's a person, not a set of rules. If you're married, you don't want your wife to come in and not speak to you and say, give me. If you're married, you don't want your husband to come in the house and not speak to you. Hey, baby, how you doing? And just say, give me. You don't want your kids to come in the house and say, give me. And that's exactly how some of us treat the Lord. Good morning, Jesus. How are you doing? Uh, how can I serve you today? Can I minister to you, Lord? Can I give you worship? Can I give you praise? Can I give you my tears? Can I, can I pay uh, some tithes or offerings? What, what would you like, Lord? What can I do for you? Can I praise you in the dance? Can I speak in my prayer language in tongues? What, what can I minister to you? How are you doing? What, what are you feeling? Some people never talk to God like that in their whole life because they don't understand him as a person. Do you ever ask the Lord how he's feeling? Sometimes his heart is heavy. You know how I know that? Because if you are a minister in the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ will put his heart in your heart. He will put, okay, and coma, hey, for, okay, I'm gonna pray for that. When I get through teaching, I'll pray for that. Remind me, and coma, I will, I will pray for that, okay? Spirit of delays and limitations, okay? Because Jesus Christ will put his heart in your heart. Uh, evangelists know that because God will put his burden for the loss in your heart. Prophets know that because God will put his word in your mouth and it'll be like fire in your bones. You have to say what the Lord put in you to say. Uh, pastors know that because God put his shepherd's heart, his love for people, his love for the sheep in you. Because if you are a minister in the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ will put his heart in your heart. Did you ever go before the Lord and ask him how he felt? Did you ever go before the Lord and ask him what kind of day was he having? Did you ever go before the Lord and ask him, Lord, are you pleased with what you see? What are you thinking and feeling right now? Did you ever do that? If you did do that, it's because you don't understand him as a person. And that's what we're doing. No more genies tonight to get rid of that. So the Lord said, again, we're still in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, conditional, my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And there's one more and. We ain't done yet. He says, and turn from their wicked ways. Good God Almighty. God says, and turn from their wicked ways. What does that mean? What does it mean to turn? And what does it mean to have wicked ways? To turn means you're not going to live that way anymore. You're going to not practice what you're doing. You're not going to walk in that way, but you're going to turn to what the Lord wants. What does it mean to be wicked? Okay, because sometimes Christians get confused between weakness and wickedness. Everybody has weakness. The Bible says that a just man falls seven times and rises up again. Everybody has weaknesses, infirmities, things you're struggling with, things you haven't mastered yet, things you haven't healed from yet. Okay? Everybody has weakness. But what is wickedness? Wickedness is when you are doing something that is against the will of God and you know it's the will of God and you keep on doing it anyway. When you set in your heart to do evil and you delight in that that's wicked in the eyes of god and if you want to see more detailed descriptions i don't have time to go through it all tonight look up every time the bible calls somebody wicked because the bible calls several people wicked like uh during the story of esther in the book of esther it calls haman wicked because he hated the jews and he was trying to commit genocide haman was literally trying to wipe out all of the jews so look up whenever the bible calls somebody wicked uh study in the book of proverbs as well Whenever the Bible talks about wickedness and you get a better picture of what God means when he says wicked. When you set up in your heart, some people ain't happy until they've stolen your joy. Some people ain't happy until they have something negative to say. Now we all get in a mood sometimes. That's why I'm not talking about weakness. A weakness. I'm not talking about making a mistake. We all get in a mood sometimes. I'm talking about when you make it your business to have something negative to say all the time. When you develop a critical spirit and you can't never find nothing good to say and nobody doing nothing right. And every time you show up is with criticism. God himself is not like that. Even when the Lord rebukes us, he gives us hope in the rebuke. 
even when the Lord rebukes us, he calls us to repentance, meaning I'm not happy with this, but if you turn from it, I'll bless you if you turn to the way that I want you to turn to. So even Christ gives us hope in his rebuke, but not negative people. Here they come with their criticism, especially people that don't never say nothing to you until you do something wrong. Good God Almighty, I know what I'm talking about. People that don't never say anything to you until you've made a mistake, then here they come with a list of all this, how you ain't saved and I knew you were no good and you think you're all that and all that. See, wickedness is in your heart. Another example of wickedness is Cain. One thing you want to avoid in life is the spirit of Cain. What do I mean when I say the spirit of Cain? I'll tell you what I mean. The spirit of Cain is when you would you don't want to kill what God told you to kill to get right with God. You'd rather kill your brother. That's the spirit of Cain. That is exactly what Cain did. Instead of killing a lamb and offering a sacrifice where blood was shed, which is what Abel did, which is why God honored it. Cain got mad because God didn't honor his fruits and vegetables because there's no blood in fruits and vegetables. There's not a sacrifice. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So instead of going to get a lamb, killing the lamb, Cain would rather have killed Abel and he did. That's the spirit of Cain. When God tells you you need to get something in check or you need to change or whatever so you can get blessed, and instead of killing what God told you to kill, you're going to go kill somebody else. That's the spirit of Cain. That's wicked. You would rather destroy somebody else's life than get your own life right with God. That's wickedness. Okay? So like I said, I don't have time to go through all of it. So God says, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. God said, you got to stop living in wickedness. Then the Bible says, then, then will what? Then will I hear from heaven. Stop. God said, then will I hear from heaven. Do you know what that means? Do you know what God just told us? God just told us that if you don't do all that stuff, I said, I'm not even going to hear you. Why do you think we keep praying and praying and praying and praying and Rona's still here? Because we keep skipping over. <laughs> we keep skipping over all the stuff God said to do. I just read it to you. If my people who are called by my, self, called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then. So we keep praying and praying. Oh, Lord, take run away. Oh, Lord, blah, blah, blah. But you keep skipping all the requirements because God said, until you do all that stuff, I'm not even going to hear you. You got to be a Christian. You got to humble yourself. You got to pray. You got to seek his face and you got to turn from your wicked ways. Then God will hear you. My, 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 my. And then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. There it is. Okay. This is reason number one why I do not care what kind of names people call me. You can call me crazy. You can say prophets aren't real. You can say there are no more prophets now. That was all in the Bible. That doesn't happen anymore. You can say David Taylor is crazy. I don't care what you say about me. The word of God is active and alive and around you now. You are, in fact, living it every day. God said, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Are you trying to tell me that our land is not afflicted? Are you trying to tell me that the world has not been afflicted as a whole? Are you trying to tell me that America has not been afflicted? Are you trying to tell me that our land doesn't need healing? God said, you got to hold up your end of the deal. You got to do all that stuff I told you to do for me to hear you. Now, can you see how so many prayers have been lifted up to God and they've been wasted because God didn't even hear them? Because we didn't do none of what the Lord said do. He's not looking to worldly people. He's looking to believers to do all that what he said. And God said, you got to do all that. Then I'm going to hear you. You got to meet the conditions of the conditional prophecy to get the results. Then he said, then I'll hear from heaven. Then I'll forgive your sin. And then I'll heal your land. So I don't care what people says. Is our land healed? Yes or no? One more time. Is our land healed? Yes or no? Remember the first scriptures I read you at the top of the hour talked about 40 years of rest and 80 years of rest. Is our land healed? Because the Lord ain't hurt us. And the Lord hasn't hurt us because we haven't done all that what he said to do. Okay? Now, that's why we don't need any more churches. 
I'm going to segue into this next thing, and you're going to see what I'm talking about. I'm going to make it plain to you, all right? Now, what I'm about to say, some of y'all have never heard of this in your entire life. What I'm about to say now, some of y'all have never, ever heard any minister say what I'm about to say. Now, some of y'all have, but some of y'all haven't. Some of y'all, what I'm about to say is going to be brand new. First time in your life you ever heard somebody break it down like I'm going to break it down. Mm -hmm. What's the first institution that God created? First institution that God created was a family. The first institution that God created was a family. When Noah saved the world because he found grace in God's eyes, what did God do? God put Noah in the same position that Adam was in. And he told him to be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth through his family. When God got ready to make a covenant to create the chosen people, the Israelites, what did God do? He called a 75-year-old man and a 65-year-old woman and told them they were going to have a baby. He made a family that he then grew into a nation. Do you understand that the miracle that kicked off our faith was a hundred year old man making love to his 90 year old wife, conceiving and birthing a child? God literally gave Abraham and Sarah the power to make love again after their bodies were dead and for Sarah to receive strength to have a baby at 90 years of age. That's the miracle that started our faith. A family, okay? At no time, now the, the Bible says this is scriptural because uh, <clears throat> the Lord said it to King David. King David wanted to build God a temple. He wanted to build God a temple very, very badly. He's very, very focused on it. And the Lord said this to David. The Lord said, at no time did I ever ask y'all to build me a temple. One more time. <laughs> The Lord said to King David, at no time did I ever ask y'all to build me a temple. Now, Moses had a tabernacle, David had a tabernacle, but God never asked for a temple. Did you know that? Did you notice that the Lord did not talk about church until he came down here as a person, until he came down here as a human? And do you know why? Because he knew his family was going to reject him. When the Holy Ghost fell on Pentecost, the Holy Ghost fell on 120 Jews. The Holy Ghost never planned to fall on 120 Jews. He planned to fall on a nation of Jews. But they rejected their king. They rejected Christ. So he had to tear off a remnant. What happens at the end of the Bible? The end of the Bible is a wedding. It's the bridegroom, which is Jesus, marrying who? The body of Christ, which is his bride. Look at that. The Bible starts with a wedding, and the Bible ends with a wedding. The Bible starts with a family, and the Bible ends with a family. God never mentioned a temple in the Old Testament. That was David. Now, once they decided to do it, God said, you have to do it right because God ain't cheap. So David and Solomon had to put a lot of money. They put they put hundreds of millions, maybe billions, maybe tens of billions, maybe hundreds of billions of dollars in that temple. But that's because God said, if you're going to do it, you have, you're going to have to do it right. But it's never something he asked for. He never asked for a temple. He ever, so you have to look at the Lord's pattern. That's what I meant when I said you have to get to know him as a person. Every time he wanted to establish something, what did he establish? He established a family. A family. Now, why is that relevant to now? Why is that important to what we're saying? I'll show you why. I'll show you one of my favorite scriptures and one of the most deadly scriptures in the Bible, which will also speak to coronavirus. That is uh, Malachi chapter 4, verses, uh, verse 6. Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. Malachi is not logically the last book in the Old Testament in terms of the order was written, but it is chronologically in the King James ordering the last book of the Old Testament. So Malachi was not written, actually written last, but Malachi is set last in the traditional King James ordering of the Bible. Okay? Malachi chapter four, verse six. Well, let me read five and six. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet for the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise I will come and strike the land with a curse. But King James says, I will come and smite the earth with a curse. I'll come and smite the earth with a curse. I wanna ask you a question. What's been going on on the earth for the last year and a half? 
This is why I don't care what people say about the Bible. This is why I don't care if people say it's not relevant. What has happened? The whole earth has been smitten with a curse. Why? Did you notice in that verse, God did not mention a temple or a church? Now, don't misunderstand me. Because some of y'all are going to say I'm preaching sacrilege and blasphemy. That ain't what I'm saying. If the Lord told you to start a church, then do it. The Lord told you to preach, do it. That ain't what I'm saying. I'm saying, did you notice in that verse, he did not mention anything about the temple. He said he's looking at families. We have messed up so badly in the eyes of God until he has smitten the entire earth with a curse and is wiping people out by the thousands every day. You know why? Because God said, I'm looking at the hearts of the families. These children are not being respectful to their fathers. These fathers' hearts are not towards their children. And then you have a lot of single moms poisoning the children against the father. If you're one of those women who you mad with the daddy, be mad at the daddy. If you get in the ear of your child and you poison that child against his father, God going to judge you for that. Did you know that? Why? Because God said to honor thy father and thy mother, not honor thy father and thy mother if they're perfect. It's something we have a tendency to do. We have a tendency to have a laundry list of all the things our parents did wrong. And you're going to keep that list in your heart until you become a parent. And all of a sudden it's going to look different to you then. But the commandment of God is to honor thy father and thy mother, the first commandment with a promise, that thy days may be long in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Not honor your father and your mother if they're perfect. You're not supposed to be getting in the ear of your child, poisoning them against their parent. Did you know that? If you do that, God is going to judge you for that. Let me tell you what the Lord told me. I give you the revelation he gave me. The Lord told me that he picks the mama and the daddy to send you through because there's certain things he wants to build into you. So he reaches back in the mother's bloodline and gets the good things he planted in that bloodline. And he reaches back in the father's bloodline and gets the good things he planted in the father's bloodline and puts those into you. And that's what makes you you. And God is like, how dare you curse? How dare you cuss out the very vehicles that I use to make you you? See, all that stuff, all the imperfections of your parents, all that stuff comes from sin. And that comes from Adam. That's not God. God never meant for us to pass through sin before we were born. Did you know that? God never, ever meant for us to pass through sin before we were born. That happened because Adam sinned. If Adam had not sinned, we would never have to pass through sin and we would be born like Jesus was born without a sin nature. Like Adam and Eve were created without a sin nature. See, that's what God wanted. But Adam and Eve, Eve listened to the devil. Adam listened to her. They ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the flesh curse was born. The sin nature was born. And then God dropped curses when he saw they had brought sin into this beautiful world that God gave us. Can you see that? So in other words, all the beef that you have with your mom and your daddy is not God because they're not perfect. Uh, if they did stuff wrong, that wasn't God. That's the sin curse. That's not what God said. God said, you honor them because I took substance from the mama's bloodline and all the good things I put in the mama's bloodline. And God said, I took substance from the daddy's bloodline and all the good things. Because when the Lord showed me that, it reminded me and or showed me again that God is positive. God is pure. God is love. It's just like the Bible says, he thinks nothing but good thoughts about us. The thoughts he thinks towards us are great and mighty and high and wonderful. And all that other stuff is sin. That's Adam's fault. That's not God's fault. And so God is saying, when I think of you, I think about all the good. See, my heart is getting full. God is saying, when I think of you, I think about all the good things that I want to put into you. And I'm going to use this woman and this man. And while you're forming in her womb, I'm going to pour into you. That's why you're a good athlete. That's why you're good with matters of the law. That's why you're good with words. That's why you're a good musician. That's why you're a good anything. All those gifts. Haven't you ever heard somebody say, man, you sound just like your daddy? Man, you look just like your mama. Haven't you ever heard somebody talk about the gifts that run in your family? Like grandmama sang and mama and them sang and now you sing and, and, and granddaddy play football 
and your father played pro ball. Now you play pro ball. Why do you think that is? That's the gift of God from generation to generation. See, my heart is so full right now because God is a good God and all that stuff. But you said, but Prophet Taylor, my parents abused me. That was not God. That was them. My daddy didn't do what he was supposed to do. That was not God. That's not Father God. That's his failing as a man because he's human and he's a sinner and he didn't do everything right. God told you, you still have to honor him. How do we do that, Prophet Taylor? I'll tell you how. If you can't say anything but, I thank my mother for giving me life. If you can't say anything other than, I thank my father for giving me life, then say that. Just say that. That's what, if, if you can't find nothing else good to say, just say that. Okay? And then you will honor them and then you will get the blessing because God said, you better not be cussing. The very vessels I use to make you you. God said, don't you dare cuss that. God said, you honor that. It is not say honor them if they're not perfect. Or, a lot, or, or it doesn't say honor them, you know, unless they're perfect or, you know, they have to be perfect. No, 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 no. You are who you are because God sent you through the seed of that man and grew you in the womb of that woman. And he took from those two bloodlines and poured so many good things into you. And God said, how dare you cuss that? That's why I'm trying to tell you, if you are one of them single parents that is poisoning your child against the other parent, God going to judge you for that. If you mad at the mama, let that stay between the adults. Do not get in the ear of your child and pour all that poison into your child. If you mad at the daddy, let that stay between the adults. Okay, because now if you were raped, that's different. If somebody forced you to do something you didn't want to do, that was against your will. But if you laid down with them and made a baby, y'all did that together. You made a choice. Okay? Don't take that out on the child. That's not the child's fault. That, you know, once you were so in love, you couldn't get enough of each other. And now you hate each other so much that you blah, blah, blah. None of that is the baby's fault. None of that is the baby's fault. None of, and there's so many of us now. Understand, hear me what I'm saying. It doesn't mean if you're the child in that situation that you don't have to heal. You do have to heal. If mom and daddy drop the ball, you're going to have to heal. There's so many of us that have spent so many time, so much time in our lives hating ourselves, not finding our purpose or destiny, getting involved with the wrong people, perpetuating that abuse because we didn't get the healing that we need. So I am not saying that we don't need healing when mom and daddy drop the ball because we do. But I'm saying the way to get blessed, remember I told you the way to get blessed is do what the Lord said do. Let me give, let me say, tell you something that's going to set you free. You don't have to understand it. You don't have to like it. <laughs> it doesn't have to make sense to you. Remember I told you about arguing with the maker. Don't argue with the maker. Just do what the maker say do. And if the maker say honor your father, then honor him. Now me personally, I'm going to get personal. I'm so proud to be David Taylor's son. I don't know what to do. I love my dad. I love my dad. My father's not a perfect man. I'm not a perfect man. I love my dad. I love my, love my daddy. I love my dad to this day. Okay. I'm so proud to be David Taylor's son. I don't know what to do. But this is what I'm trying to tell you. You, if you want the blessing of God, you got to do what God said do. And God said, don't you cuss the vehicles I use to make you you just because they ain't perfect. You ain't perfect either. Why do you have kids? You talk all that yang about your parents. You can talk all that yang all you want to. Why do you have kids? Number one. Number two, there comes certain times in your life in certain areas where you turn into your parents. You done fought and fought and fought and said your whole life, I ain't going to be like that. I ain't going to do that, blah, 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 blah. And there have been times in my life where I looked up and and I did the same thing my father did. I'm, I'm thinking just like my dad. I'm like, sometimes I hear my mother's voice in my head. I was like, I sound like Ma. <laughs> because you are the fruit of their body. God said, don't you cuss that. I made you you because of that. Don't you cuss that. And that's why I'm telling you is one of the most foundational reasons that Corona is here. 
Because God said, we don't fool around and let these children get disrespectful and they're no longer honoring their parents. And God said, when you do that, your day is going to get cut short. God says in no uncertain terms, when you don't honor your mother and your father, your days get cut short. You're going to die. You're going to die before your time. You're going to die too soon. And we also done fooled around and uh, as single parents, not form families, go back to your parents or your grandparents or your great grandparents, probably your grandparents or your great grandparents. Then people got married. They knew how to stay married. No, they didn't like it. No, every day wasn't, you know, wasn't sunshine and roses. Blah, blah, blah. Then people stayed married till they died because they said they would because they took their vows and they held the family together. You can't tell me, especially if you come from a black family, you can't tell me that you didn't have a grandmama or an auntie or a big sister, somebody knew how to hold it down, okay? It was my grandmother that introduced me to Christ. I had an experience like Samuel. Uh, the Lord talked to me when I was a very small child, but I didn't know it was him. I needed an Eli in my life, but what I did know is that when I came around my grandmother, I felt the presence of God around her and in her home. And that's how I knew that God was real. I knew he was real because I felt him and I saw him in her before I got to know him for myself because my grandmother did her job. Why would you Why would you ever badmouth that? I'm a Christian today because of her. Because she let me know that the Lord was real. You ain't in church every day. You in church for a few hours on Sunday, maybe. You in your life every day. And it's the family, it's the family that has that impact on your life every day. And God said, uh, now, uh, my son's on, on the thing tonight. Uh, he'll corroborate what I'm about to say. It was either two or three years ago, we went out for Father's Day. And Father's Day is one of my favorite times because I love spending time with him. And I told my son as we sat down to eat, I said, what we're doing is so important to God. Until if we weren't doing this, God didn't say he would smite a town. God didn't say he would smite a city. God didn't even say he would smite a nation. God said, I smite the earth. God said, I'm going to draw my hand back and I'm going to hit the whole earth. This is why I keep telling you the Bible is relevant. You're living the Bible every day. Do not let anybody tell you that the Bible is old and archaic and not relevant. Because what has been plaguing the earth for the last year and a half? Rona. Because God is not pleased with our family situations. We are no longer forming families. We, we're, we just want to have uh, unlimited sexual freedom. Let me tell you what happens when you have unlimited sexual freedom. Because that's what America has worked really hard to make our new social contract. You can have sex with anybody that you want. Let me tell you what happens when you have unlimited sexual freedom. When you have unlimited sexual freedom, you're going to create throwaway people. You're going to create children that you don't want. So women will purposely try to give themselves a miscarriage or have an abortion to terminate the pregnancy. You're also going to have seniors that you don't want to take care of because you don't have any respect for your family. So your parents made all that sacrifice when you were young to take care of you. And now they've gotten old and now you don't want to be bothered with them. It works both ways and it works on both ends. Where I got to stop my car again and get that light going. Works on both ways and it works both ends, don't worry about that beeping. Works on both ways, both ways and works on both ends when you have respect for the family. But when you have sexual free-for-alls, no boundaries, no restrictions, no, no commandments of God, nothing, not focusing your energy on your family, on your spouse, like God told you to, you create throwaway people. Do you know what that does to the economy? What happens when you have a bunch of kids that don't nobody want to take care of? Uh, and what happens when you have a bunch of seniors that don't nobody want to take care of? That's supposed to be the family job. The church is supposed to focus on orphans and widows. That's what the scriptures say. The body of Christ is supposed to focus on women whose husbands have died and children whose parents have died or don't have no parents. That means everybody else is supposed to be taking care of their family. That's right. There's another side effect. Because if you were raised by a single parent, I stopped by to tell you, you were raised on the run. You were raised, I don't care what you say. Mom and daddy did the best they could, but if you were raised by a single parent, you was raised on the run because parenting is a three-person job plus extended family plus a village. It's Jesus, daddy, mama, plus the siblings, plus extended family, plus the village. That's what it takes to raise a child. And trying to do all that work yourself, it doesn't matter how much your mother loves you. Your mother's love is not your father's love. They don't feel the same. 
doesn't matter how much your father loves you. Your father's love is not your mother's love. They don't feel the same. And that's why some people, no matter how well you were raised, they spend the rest of their lives looking for that piece that was missing because it's Jesus, daddy, and mama. Not out here making more and more uh, being a single parent. Because if you were raised by a single parent, you was raised on the run. And you spent some time in your life, whether you want to admit it or not, looking for the missing parent. If you grew up without a dad, you spent some time in your relationships looking for a dad. If you grew up without a mom, you spent some time in your relationships looking for a mom because you're supposed to have both of them. But when we have unlimited sexual freedom, then we, we create children we don't want to take care of, seniors, parents, grandparents we don't want to take care of, but there's another thing that happened. And it, it became such an epidemic until the first lady of the country had to create a program. I'm referring to, of course, Michelle Obama's Let's Move. And that is childhood obesity. In this country, if you spend the first 10 years of, of your life in this country, you are already beginning to show the signs of heart disease, arterial sclerosis. By the time you're 10 years old, do you know why? Because when you're raised by a single parent, you don't always have time to cook every night. You can't always afford healthy and nutritious meals. And so many times you just raise your kids on fast food. If you raise your children on fast food, that's how we create childhood obesity. And by the time you've eaten that diet for the first 10 years of your life, you are already overweight at 10. That would be different if daddy and mama was there and there's enough money coming in and mama's a keeper at home, like the scriptures say, and mama's cooking, cooking healthy, nutritious meals and making sure you exercise your whole life would be different. Some of y'all been struggling with obesity since you were young because your parents didn't have time to do anything but feed you fast food as opposed to cooking. Very, very different. That's another side effect of being raised on the run. And that's what happens when we push for unlimited sexual freedom. There's a lot of other side effects because a lot of people don't put uh, sexual choices together with uh, economic choices, but they go together. And so God has looked down at what we've done and he is so displeased that the whole earth has been smitten. How can you argue? How can you say that the Bible isn't relevant? How can you say that the Bible isn't true? When we've been living with Rona for a year and a half now, or close to it, at least 12 months, if not 18 months yet. How, how can you say? See, and so that's what I mean when I say, this is an example of what I mean about turning from our wicked ways. What has to happen going forward into 2021 is that we, as believers, we have to reestablish families. We can't just go around See, this is what happened in the Bible. I like to give you living examples. This is what happened to King David. If you don't know the story of King David, long story short, King David saw a woman bathing on a rooftop. Obviously, she's naked because she's bathing. He asked who she was. They told him that's Uriah's wife. He said, go get her. He slept with her. They started an affair. He got her pregnant. He brought Uriah home to try to sleep with his wife to pass the baby off as his. Uriah said, I'm not going to sleep with my wife while my brothers are on the battlefield fighting. I shouldn't be at home having pleasure with my wife while my brothers are fighting because Uriah had more honor than David in that situation. And then David had him and all the men in his company killed so he could have Bathsheba. They had a funeral. They moved. He moved Bathsheba into the palace and they was going to keep him moving like nothing happened. And then God sent the prophet Nathan to rebuke David to make David see all of the sin that he had done. Do you know what happened in David's life after that? One of his sons became so rebellious that he slept with all his concubines in front of the whole nation. That was the highest form of disrespect you could show your father in Israel. Uh, one of his sons, Amnon, raped his sister, Tamar. So Amnon was so in lust with his sister, his sister, until he raped her. And he had a friend that told him, pretend you're sick, have your sister fix you some food. And when she comes in the room to minister the food to you, you can have your way with her. And that's exactly what Amnon did. And Tamar begged him, please, brother, please don't do this. Please don't humble me. Please don't force me. Please don't rape me. Please don't take my virginity this way. Please don't do this to me. I'm a princess. I'm a daughter of the king. What, what am I going to do without my virginity? How am I going to tell people that my own brother forced me? She begged him and he wouldn't hear it. He wouldn't hear it. And Ammon raped her. And then after he raped her, 
the Bible says he hated her just as much after he raped her as he loved her before he did it. That's just lust. Do you know why that happened? That happened because King David brought all that in his bloodline because he went and got another man's wife and had her husband killed. So adultery, lust, murder, and death came into his bloodline. Do you understand that? Do you understand that there are many of us that have been dealing with things from our parents because of stuff that happens from our parents or grandparents and they brought stuff in the bloodline? Why am I saying that? I'm saying because we gonna have to go back to what they used to call old school, but old school is just biblical and do it the way the Lord said do it. Point your sexual energy at your spouse, not side chicks, not side men, not all this other stuff we've been doing that God is not pleased with, but he's expecting his people to live by his word. How can you make a statement like that, Prophet Taylor? Because I told you from the top of this teaching, all that church activity we had didn't stop the Rona from coming, did it? They had rest 40 years and 80 years in the Old Testament. All that church, all them broadcasts, all them conferences, all that stuff we was doing, it didn't stop the Rona, did it? How can you argue with that? The Rona's here. But God said, I, I want to see the hearts of the children turn to the fathers and the fathers turn back to the children. And you can't be uh, a single parent messing with that either. Don't be poisoning your child against the other parent. That's a huge mistake. So I don't have time to talk about all of it tonight. I'm going to have to wrap it up there. But that is one of the things that the Lord is looking for going into 2021. And if you I told you, if you receive this prophetic word, signs and wonders and miracles are going to follow your life. You need to make it your business to get things right with your family. If your parents are still alive and you've got beef, forgive them and reconcile. If you're the parent and you got beef with your children, forgive them and reconcile. Cousins, aunts, uncles, siblings, whatever. you got beef, forgive them and reconcile. That's what God is looking for. If you have small children, don't you teach them children to disrespect their mama. Don't you teach them children to disrespect their daddy. Old school, when our parents used to fight, they would fight away from us. They would send us out the room because they had something when I was a child called grown folks business. And whenever grown folks was talking, I couldn't even sit in the room with the adults. Me and my cousins, we had to go to the back porch. We still laugh about that all the time. We couldn't sit in the room when the grown folks was talking because they drew a line between that those which were adults and those which were children. We're going to have to go back to that level of respect. Don't you be teaching your children to disrespect their mama. Don't you be teaching your children to disrespect their daddy. That's why the earth is in trouble. I showed it to you in the scripture. Okay? So moving forward, moving forward into 2021, one of the things we're going to have to do to turn from our wicked ways is to restore the family the way God said to make a family. All right? All right. That's all I have time for now. I know I went kind of long, but I needed to release all that. Okay? Now, somebody asked me to pray. I'm going to pray for him. I believe it was right. And Coma Hafer, all right. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you bless their soul uh, to overcome procrastination. That's a demon. Okay, procrastination is a spirit, the spirit of delays and limitations. If you're procrastinating, that's the devil. You need to rebuke that. So I rebuke that off you in Jesus' name. I cast out the spirit of procrastination. If you are dealing with delays and limitations, that's a matter of faith. You're going to have to get the word of God in your mouth and you're going to have to keep saying what God says to make those oppositions back up off of you. That's a fight of faith if you're being delayed and limitations are trying to be put on you. If God has given you a dream, you have to get the word of your God in your mouth and say it every day and rebuke the devil because he's not just going to lay down and let you take the land. You can't beat him, but he just ain't going to lay down and let you take it. You're going to have to fight. Okay. All right. If I have any more prayer requests, put them on the screen. If you would like to bless my ministry, I don't do what I do for money. Obviously, I'm sitting in my car. <laughs> I do what I do because it's what the Lord wants me to do. But if you want to bless my ministry, you can uh, bless me through Zelle. Uh, the reason I prefer Zelle is because Zelle doesn't really deal with any fees which is really cool. So you can uh, send stuff to my personal email. I'll send you my personal email. And I'll also give you my profit email if you would like to bless me financially. 
I don't use uh, the other stuff anymore because they take fees out, but Zill does not. Okay, so that's why it is now my preferred method. Okay, so if you want to bless me financially, hit me up on Zill. Thank you so much to those of you that watch me live. Uh, thank you to so much to those of you that are watching the replay. Please remember to like and share the video because as many people as possible need to hear the word of God. If you've been blessed by what you heard tonight, then please, by all means, share it with somebody else so they can get a blessing, so they can get deliverance, so they can get the healing that they need. Okay? All right. Amen and amen. Now, remember, I am here uh, every second Thursday. Second Thursday. So No More Genies only happens once a month. So every second Thursday, I'm here live like we were tonight. Then I'm here every Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time um, for the weekly live prophetic word. So 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the weekly live prophetic word. Okay? So tonight's teaching was, we don't need no more churches, okay? So if you came in in the middle, go back and watch this from the top and let the words minister to you so you can get blessed. All right? Amen and amen. Thank you so much for joining me. I will see you this Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next weekly live prophetic word. And I will see you next year, second Thursday night in January for the next No More Genies. All right? Amen and God bless.